So, I mean, the first part of the session, um, we would like to really, really happy, uh, happily welcome Glasgow to be our new member, our new UTA member. We would like to really separate this uh, news within our community. And for that instant, uh, we are lucky and we are happy uh, Michael Wall will give us a presentation uh, on the topic of Play Standard Tool, which is um, a sustainable uh, community neighborhood planning tool. And that's uh, he devised for the city of Glasgow. And the next session, we will of course have a Q&A and reflection section here. And so all your questions can, uh, can be, uh, if you have any reflection on um, Michael's presentation or his personal work experience, so here's a place um, to ask. And beside that, this is also, uh, I think I see this is really the core sections of this webinar. So I really encourage, encourage us to have a very interactive uh, discussion here. So I will also invite you to share your own work experience and cases regarding neighborhood building in this area. So we will dedicate here around 30 minutes to do that. And the last part, we will wrap up the discussion today and I will share with you our current planning for the next year, UTA 2021. So uh, just quick uh, reminder for all of you, this session will be recorded and all the questions, I encourage you to save it and raise your question in the q and session. And if during the technical session, uh, during the session you have any technical issue, please just uh, use the comment buttons and we will help you to overcome it. So first, um, I would like to thanks again, Michael, to um, uh, really um, dedicate his time um, to the UTA community and give us this uh, coming presentation regarding neighborhood building and regarding this innovative tool. Uh, Glasgow has been using quite a while. I think Michael will give us more uh, background story about uh, how do they actually come up with tool and how do they actually working with NHS which is the National Health uh, Organizations uh, uh, from UK. So Michael Ward um, is the principal planner uh, from Development and Regeneration Service from Glasgow City Council. I think Michael Ward has um, um, lots of experience on sustainable strategy, especially regarding neighborhood planning and building activities. Um, now I would uh, don't waste any time and give the floor or give the screen uh, to <laughs> Michael now. <laughs> Thank you, Yang Chi. Okay. Okay. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. Okay. Just bear with me while I get so is, is everybody seen the first slide okay in the presentation? Yes. Uh, if you can make full screen it would be even better. Okay. Hold on a wee second. Okay, is that full screen now? Perfect. Okay. Okay, just um, just to quickly introduce myself, uh, as Ying Chi said, my name is Michael Ward. I work for Glasgow City Council and have done for the last 21 years, I think now, um, and mainly in spatial planning. I've did some what we call development management here in Scotland, um, processing planning applications, but the majority of my career has been in sort of spatial, spatial strategy uh, or neighbourhood planning, uh, as you might know it. 
Um, so I want to talk to you today about a wee bit about my journey, I suppose, towards the, the play standard tool. Um, I'll, I'll not take credit for the development of the play standard tool. One of my colleagues was much more heavily involved, but I think it's useful to sort of tell my story and a, a little bit about the story of Glasgow, how we've got to where we've got to today, why we felt something like the play standard was necessary. Um, so I'm quickly going to talk just very briefly, for those of you who don't know the city very well, about its history, how it developed, um, the sort of current position or challenges and opportunities that we have in the city. Uh, and as I said, my own work journey uh, with a particular focus on the east end of Glasgow, uh, which we'll talk a wee bit more about as we go through. But that was where I spent the first sort of 12 years of my working life, um, working in the east end of the city. So I have a special fondness for it. Um, and a special affinity with it, and perhaps at the time, one of the most challenging parts of the city. So, and it's really central to the story of play standard and how we got there. So I'll just, uh, I'll run through this. There's a lot of slides, but I'll, I'll run through them very quickly. I appreciate that my uh, Scottish accent might be quite difficult to understand. So hopefully you can all understand me uh, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Yes, we like the accent. Um, Michael, uh, we can actually see your presenter note. I mean, we don't mind, but if you want to hide it, uh, we can can do it. Okay. But we can see the slide perfectly. But at the same time, we can see the presenter note. If okay, let me just check what. Hey, so with this one, I should share. Is that better? You're getting the full screen now? Yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. perfect. Okay, so at the moment we start out, every city has to have a vision. I think that's the, the law now. So this this is our vision, if you like, is the idea of a, a world-class city, whatever whatever that might mean. Um, focused on economic growth, but also, in particular for Glasgow, closing that inequality gap and addressing poverty, which exists in the city. Um, but these are some of the, the, the kind of images of Glasgow today, if you like, as it exists. Um, so almost the, the kind of tourist brochure for the city, but there's a lot um, going on in the city and that, that's our vision. But I'll, I'll now quickly, very briefly run you through the history of, of Glasgow. Uh, like many cities, I suppose, it emerged because of its proximity to, to the water and the river, the River Clyde in our instance. Um, so Glasgow emerges very much in the kind of medieval um, era as a, as a centre for education and religion, primarily in the first instance. Um, the University of Glasgow opened in 1451, one of the oldest uh, universities in Europe, and the city sort of developed gradually and slowly over the next few hundred years um, until we had the next period of, of massive growth uh, when Glasgow becomes a trading city largely uh, due to a happy circumstance, if you like, of our facing the Atlantic and those shipping links with the Americas. Now, in the current climate, I think it's, it's worthwhile acknowledging that, that this history is not without its problems. If, if Glasgow's massive growth and wealth as a merchant and trading city grew off the back of trade and particularly tobacco, um, sugar uh, and cotton to an extent, and I think probably more so now than ever, I think people are much more aware of the history and the connotations of that. But for Glasgow, it meant a period of, of huge growth, eh, both in terms of wealth and population as people moved into the city. The next era, I suppose, when we see is when we see the explosion of population in Glasgow when we reach its peak eh, with the Industrial Revolution and the Industrial Age, where Glasgow becomes um, what was known as the second city of the empire. Uh, but in particular, we became famous for shipbuilding um, and Clyde built was, was a badge of quality across the globe in shipbuilding. So by the turn of um, the 20th century, approximately a fifth of the world's shipping was built in Glasgow. Um, and it was a huge employer in the city and of massive importance. You can see in the, the image in the bottom right, the number of people who would turn up for the launch of a, a, a new vessel when it was completed. So there was a huge amount of civic pride tied up in that, that industry as well. It wasn't just an employer and an economic generator. It was something of which the, the city was very proud. 
Um, the next period, I suppose, is when we, we start to run into trouble, if you like, and I suppose the reason for these networks in post-industrial cities is when Glasgow starts its journey to becoming a, a post-industrial city. The, the Second World War, I think, um, although it delayed um, the decline that had already started in shipbuilding, because the, the Clyde side became important again in terms of um, warships and, and armaments, it also made it a target, I suppose. Um, so the image you see here in the top left is the, the Luftwaffe's bombing plan for the Clyde. And you can see that the aftermath of that. Um, but perhaps an even um, bigger shock for the city was coming after the war when, when shipbuilding almost entirely ceases in the city. And we run into that period of real decline uh, of our city's heavy industries, shipbuilding, engineering, uh, and manufacturing. The images at the bottom are about that kind of political unrest and that the turbulence that that caused for the city. Very unusually on the Clyde side, we had a, a work in. So the image here is a, a gentleman called Jimmy Reid, who's quite a famous Glaswegian um, trade unionist who led, uh, as I said, very unusually, it was what was called a work in, where they closed the shipyard and continued to work while the operators of the shipyard tried to, to shut it down. So almost of the opposite of a, a traditional industrial strike, if you like, and um, the workers wanted to work, but that work was been taken away from them. So a real challenge for the city. And you start to see the legacy of that, that decline uh, in terms of the, the mass, um, the change, if you like, from the heavy industry to that real negative physical impact, but also perhaps even worse, the social impact of that decline. So the image in the top right here was a, a factory called Beardmore's, which was a, a steel a steelworks, and that employed at its peak around 40,000 people, all of whom would live nearby, they would spend money in the shops, they would go to the bank, they would use facilities. Now when that dies, effectively the community dies. So the social impact is, is almost as bad, if not worse, than the, the physical impact, which left behind huge amounts of contamination, vacant and derelict land, uh, and just some of these images at the bottom you see was um, people left living cheek by jowl with this kind of wasteland, if you like. So Glad Glasgow has to respond to these challenges. And I think our response in the sort of 1950s and 1960s to the to this position that we were in and the situation we were facing was a program called Comprehensive Redevelopment, which in essence was mass demolition and clearance out of the inner city to new peripheral estates or new towns out with the city. Um, so people were cleared out of slum houses, but they lost all their social networks and the communities that they lived in. So there's huge challenges from that. The next slide shows another um, big challenge for Glasgow, if you like, and I suppose in many cities where we embrace the, the wonders of the motor car and Glasgow's highway plan was developed. And you can see here some very compelling and, and sometimes quite beautiful images um, of our highway plan. But actually, what was the impact of that going to be on people uh, and humanity? Um, many of these roads were never developed, but what they did do was they blighted the city for many years, while a lot of these routes were reserved for development of the highway plan before we um, before we saw sense and abandoned it, if you like, but not before we ran a, a motorway right through the heart of the city. You see the image here in the bottom right, it was the, the M8 motorway that runs right through the heart of Glasgow uh, and effectively severed the city in two. So we talked a wee bit about that loss of community from the first round of slum clearance, but because of our approach to comprehensive redevelopment, by the time we reached the 1980s, we were almost at another round um, of demolition and clearance because we got the response wrong the first time. And this slide here, as I said, you're not, but you're not be able to read all of that. But if you look at the line, this just charts the, the population and demographic change that we experienced in Glasgow. Um, so, so from a very slow start and a steady increase up to the kind of mercantile period that we talked about, till we reached the peak of Glasgow's industrial age, where the population of cities were 1.1 million which remains steady, that very high level for a number of years until then we see that really steady decline start and the loss of population out of the city as we lose the industry. So we got to the point where it was below 600,000 
We're now starting to climb back up gradually. So the, the current population is just over 600,000. But that's a huge change for a city to have to deal with. And it's also left us with a, a legacy of challenges, or if you are optimistic, a, a legacy of opportunities, if you like to take the city forward. And you can see some of them here from the, the kind of Victorian infrastructure of the, the River Clyde and the, the canalisation of the river to allow the shipbuilding industry to thrive. Some of that is starting to fail. You can see the image in the centre here where we've had the key wall collapse into the river. We've got the graven docks uh, that govern where the ship, ships used to come in for repair, a site that's now been vacant for 25, 30 years. So you just see that kind of legacy and the challenges, um, but the opportunities that presents for the city to reinvent itself. And that's something I think Glasgow is very proud of, is that kind of reinvention or that resilience, if you like, to, to bounce back from these challenges. Uh, this, we've been very focused, if you like, on trying to change the image of the city. Um, so that idea of the, the, the kind of no mean city and the, you know, you see some of the quotes here from the article, a hellish mix of drink, poverty and violence. It's not really a selling point for a, for a city. So the city fathers and their wisdom had a real goal, um, recognised the importance of trying to change the image of the city. So we had campaigns like Glasgow's Miles Better in the 1980s. Uh, and I think a real turning point for the city was being awarded the, the title of European City of Culture in 1990. Um, and that's when I think people started to see Glasgow in a different way. And um, per, perhaps it's kind of the image from the outside. But today, I suppose what the, the slide is trying to show you is the, the contrast that still exists in the city. So in the top line, you have some of the um, some of the statistics and the figures about you know, Glasgow's contribution to the Scottish economy. Uh, we're very proud of our education sector. We've got you know, 130,000 students in the city. Um, we have a huge areas of green space because the Glasgow is one of our names is a dear green city. So a lot of kind of really positive things that exist in the city at the moment. But the bottom line, I think, highlights that we still face some major challenges. Um, you know, that 58% of the city living very close, uh, within 500 metres of vacant and derelict land. We have huge socioeconomic challenges in terms of education, poverty, um, fuel poverty is a huge challenge in the city. So I think just highlighting the, the, the challenges and the contrast that still exists in Glasgow. And this next slide, I think, probably brings us into, I suppose, where I um, come in and my work in the east end of the city. What this is, this is an image of the, the, the rail network in Glasgow. And what it shows you is the difference between the affluent west end in a Jordan Hill, Hindland, and a short 15 minute train journey across the city to, to the east end in Glasgow, where you can experience almost 15 years, over 14 years of a difference in life expectancy for men eh, and almost 12 years for women, just in a very short journey across, across what is a very compact city. Eh, and why is that? And how do we address that? So this is, uh, this is I suppose, where, where I come in as part of the planning team. The East End of Glasgow um, was almost perhaps the most deprived, certainly the most deprived community in Scotland but one of the most deprived communities in Western Europe. Uh, and for that reason, it was identified as a priority nationally, uh, as well as a priority for the city to, to address this. And my role in that was um, to prepare a, a development strategy for the East End of, of Glasgow. So uh, in, in effect, the planning strategy for that part of the city. But what was, was very evident to us quite quickly was that we couldn't really talk to people about planning and design and architecture. Um, because they just weren't engaging with it. And at that time, we were introduced to colleagues from the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, uh, which had been set up specifically to address some of the, uh, the kind of major population health challenges that Glasgow faced as a city. So a partnership between the City Council and the NHS in Scotland uh, to look specifically at what was happening in Glasgow. And one of their work streams was urban planning, or what they called healthy urban planning. So we met um, Dr. Russell Jones, and at the time we were very fortunate because he introduced us to 
a group of local residents in the East End who were doing a community development course. And as part of their coursework, um, they were required to do work in the community. So we were able to kind of piggyback on that and, and take advantage of that, if you like, to work with those local residents to say, well, how, how could we engage with the population um, to talk about a planning strategy for this area? And we landed on the idea of doing a health impact assessment, uh, which we'll talk a wee bit more about in the next couple of slides. So the benefits for us, I think, of doing a health impact assessment, where more traditionally we had been involved in environmental impact assessment, um, it allowed us a, a kind of new way to engage with people, because people understood how where they lived made them feel. They didn't necessarily understand urban design or legibility or accessibility or all the kind of language that we would normally use, but they understand that where they lived made them feel pretty rubbish and impacted on their health. So using health impact assessment, it was the first time we'd ever did this in a planning strategy. But immediately we were taken by how easy it was to have the kind of conversations uh, that we wanted to have with local people. And as part of that, we, um, the, the, in partnership with the local community, we did, we did a project called the Scrapbooks, whereby we just bought simple disposable cameras for local residents and just ask them to photograph their daily journeys and um, to tell us what life was like in their community. And as part of that process, we then all came together in a room to, to put these scrapbooks together. But the council officers in the room were, were just there in the background, if you like. It was, it was the local community working with each other, helping each other put together these scrapbooks. We had people coming along with literacy issues um, who perhaps had never engaged before in this way. So it was very much the kind of local community that helped us deliver this process. Um, and if you're really interested in that, there is a film on YouTube. And um, the link is on this slide, which we'll share with you later. Um, but the film is called The Social Determinants of Health uh, in Glasgow. Uh, and you can find out a wee bit more about that process. I won't show you it because there's a, a much younger version of me in it and it's a bit embarrassing, but um, that film is still used today as part of the, the um, the education program for health professionals in Glasgow, so nurses and health workers. Uh, I only found this out by accident a few years ago. I'll watch this film to understand how place can impact on health. The second stage of the process was a, was a program called the notebooks. So this was almost, the scrapbooks were largely quite negative in terms of what they showed in the local community. So the notebooks was about, well, what if, what if you were in charge? Um, and you had the money to invest in the area, what would you like to see and what would you do? So that was again, the, very much led by the local community uh, from all ages, from, from children to, to old age pensioners, helping with that process. And again, just give an idea, people the idea of the art of the possible in their community. And a big part of this program for us, uh, for the idea of people as assets, uh, was very much something that we sort of found out about through this process. So just a wee, a wee story here about a, a little boy uh, who took part in the process and he, he complained to us about puddles, which we thought, well, that's it's not normally something that a planner, a spatial planner would want to deal with. But he told us why it was important. And he scrapbooked a picture of this puddle that was always outside the play area. And he only had two pairs of shoes. So if he got his play shoes wet, he wasn't allowed out in his school shoes because he had to keep them good for school. So he told us that story. We were able to speak to colleagues in the council and get that fixed. And then Jordan becomes an asset for his community because he, he knows he can talk to people at the council and things might happen and things can change. So he becomes a positive asset for the community. The next story, we've got a couple of stories of, again about women who participated in the process. And both, both of these women, I think, um, were in a position where they very rarely left the house. They were isolated and didn't participate in their community and weren't active and weren't assets for the community. But through this programme, they, they both be, went on to become assets. One, in fact, went on to become a belly dancing teacher, uh, which was not an outcome that we had imagined, perhaps at the start of the process, nor had she, I don't think. Um, but just the idea that this, even the process of preparing a plan and strategy can change people's lives was a real eye-opener for us. We had changing lives as a, as a kind of tagline on the front of our development strategy, but, but I'm not sure we anticipated this was how people's lives would change. 
and the credit for that goes to the to the community, not the not the planners. I think for their their involvement and their engagement with the process. So I suppose the the, the key legacy for us, if you like, um, was this was this kind of legacy of a community who were then engaged, far more engaged than they were at the outset of the process, because big big change was coming in this part of the city in terms of the investment that was coming. Um, and we wanted people to be part of that change and help guide and shape that change. And I think the process that we went through meant that they were ready to do that. And just, just some images here of the kind of physical changes that have happened in that part of the city. Um, you can see you know, some of the new infrastructure, the bridges, the, the new housing that was developed uh, as part of the Commonwealth Games, which was held in uh, Glasgow in 2014. Um, which was a huge global event, sporting event for, the, for Glasgow to host. And primarily it was focused in the east end of the city uh, to a degree in terms of new facilities, the Athletes Village, which you can see in this image here from above in some of the housing in the Athletes Village that was developed as part of that. We're all in a community called Domarnock, which had almost disappeared um, prior to the, the planned investment in the area. The population had fallen, I think, from 50,000 to just over 1,000 people. And that, that was simply unsustainable as a community. But you can see the change that's happened in terms of the, the development that's happened here. Uh, and just a, a kind of, a, 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 I suppose, a slight boasting moment, an area called the Barras, uh, a famous market in, in Glasgow, uh, again, facing some major issues and major challenges a few years ago. And as part of an action plan that we developed as part of our work in the East End, it was named last year as Scotland's most improved place. And if anybody wants to know more about that, they can, they can ask me at the end. Um, but again, that was a very proud moment for us last year. So in developing that story, I think how eventually I will get to the place standard tool, but the, the story I suppose is once we completed the East End Local Development Strategy, we wanted to think, about, well, what was the benefit of that? How did that work? How can we build on that? And how can we improve that? So the Glasgow Centre for Population Health did a, a sort of briefing paper and a kind of case study on it. We were also introduced to a ministerial task force uh, called Equally Well, um, because our health minute, uh, the chief medical officer in Scotland at that time, Dr Harry Burns, was very interested in this, uh, this approach as well. So we developed relationships with the Scottish Government, with Health Scotland, with the NHS. And fundamentally, we got to thinking about placemaking and how do you make place and what makes great places. And really, the answer to that is very simple. It's people. You know, you can have beautiful places, but if there's no people there, they don't work and they don't function as places. So how do we involve people in placemaking? And I think what we learned in the East End, I suppose, was that that idea that the local people are the experts, not the planners uh, who don't live there. So they can tell you what their area needs, what happens in their area, and have a much bigger uh, or a more important um, contribution to make than, than a sort of professional officer who's only there for, um, you know, one day every couple of months or whatever, if they're working in other parts of the city. Local people are the experts, so how do we engage them properly? And what was pretty clear was that the, the old approach to planning, if you like, was not was no longer appropriate. The idea of this kind of um, designing communities on plan that look great from above, sort of helicopter planning, if you like, but on the ground, what does that really look like? Is, is that a good green space for people? Is that a space that you can relax in? Probably no. I'm sure it looked very nice on paper, but the reality of it is very different. And again, going back to that point I touched on earlier, um, our previous approach, if you like, cleared people out of what we thought of as slums and moved them in in new slums or places that eventually became new slums. So you can see some of these new de the developments, if you like, that was the response to the previous challenges, the, the high-rise flats or these peripheral estates where we had mono-use houses but no facilities for communities and people torn away from those family networks and support networks that they built up. And that idea, one of the things that working in the East End, I think, sort of drove home to me was the idea of the stigma of place where people felt looked down on or, or felt disadvantaged just because of their postcode or where they lived. Uh, and that was something that we hadn't perhaps thought about too much before. 
So the idea was almost a move then away from that kind of comprehensive redevelopment or dramatic rebuilding of places to almost place mending. How do you fix what's wrong in a place? And how do you identify what's wrong in a place? We're still not perfect at it. I think we're still too dominated by, by cars rather than places for people. But I think we're getting better at it. And just how do you take into consideration all these factors that affect people's health and well-being? Um, you know, my, my role is as a spatial planner, but I have to consider all these other factors when I'm creating spatial plans in the city in terms of, you know, people's lifestyles, their community, their local environment. You know, I suppose my biggest crossover is with the local environment. What can we do with local people to make their situation better? So the images you see are an underpass taking you under the um, Glasgow sort of motorway network. And the top image is what it used to look like. And the bottom image is not an expensive intervention, but it just makes a huge change in terms of how that makes you feel on that sort of daily journey. So it was about changing how we think about, about places. This is a very kind of traditional Glasgow space and a housing development. It's just less leftover grass. Nobody really uses it. We, we were famous for putting signs up, but telling people almost not to play on it. No ball games, which was not encouraging people to use it. But that space has the potential to be so much more, and the community has the potential to shape that space. So you can see here a program that we've initiated called Stalled Spaces, whereby we give small grants to local community groups to, to do something different with their local spaces. And that's been a hugely successful program for us over the last 10 years. And finally, as you'll, you'll all have been waiting for me to get finally get to the place standard tool. So all of these, all of these conversations and all of that kind of learning and experience um, that we developed in the East End of the City meant that working with Scottish Government and Health Scotland and our partners in Architecture and Design Scotland, how do we turn that into something almost as a kind of standardised approach um, to engage local communities to understand what their priorities are? And after um, our experiences in the East End and the idea of this healthy, sustainable neighbourhood model, that eventually becomes the place standard tool, which I'll tell you a, a wee bit more about in the next few slides. So the place standard tool was something that we think adds value to those conversations with local people and gives you a kind of agreed methodology, if you like, of talking to local communities. It's not the only way to do it. We would never advocate it as the only way to, to talk to local communities. But for us and the experience of using it has been very helpful and given us a, an understanding of, of what people are experiencing locally. And this is supported nationally. The purpose of the place standard tool, if you like, is to, is to help us meet Scottish government's aims um, and that focus on place and neighbourhood to support health and well-being and quality of life. So this is a big, a big issue for the Scottish government uh, nationally. Uh, and it's something that we've been sort of very proud to have been a big part of in Glasgow. So, so what is the tool? I mean, it's effectively a free tool that's available for anybody to use, whether it's uh, professionals, community groups, um, developers, um, can access the Play Standard tool. It exists online. There's an app. Um, it can be done in paper form and booklet. Uh, and it's really just to facilitate conversations with local communities to help identify their priorities um, and taking a kind of holistic view of the, the issues and challenges that these communities face. So it's grouped into 14 themes. Uh, you, can, you will see these, as I said, you can look online and find out a lot more detail about the Play Standard tool. I won't go through all the themes. But the next slide, I suppose, sort of groups them into that kind of the idea of kind of stewardship and governance. How is the place looked after? Um, so how do you get around in a place? Is it safe to walk around? How's the tra public transport? What do we need in the community to exist there, whether we live there or work there uh, or simply visit? Uh, but also the idea of um, kind of perceptions and culture are important. So these are the kind of group themes. It's very simple to use, but we think it's very simple to use, although sometimes the diagrams can look quite complicated. Once you use it, you, you'll find it's actually quite quite easy. You simply ask um, the users to score on a scale of one to seven, uh, how good um, each of these issues is. Uh, and that creates this kind of spider diagram or this matrix. Here. And we can then use that 
So I just go back. We can then use that to develop strategy and policy, uh, or the local co community can use it to make a bid for resources and funding for their priorities. And you have evidence for what those priorities are. When can you use it? Uh, I think you'll see from the list here that uh, we think it can be applied in a lot of circumstances, whether it's very early, early stages, whether there's a development proposal on the ground, it can be used at small neighbourhood scales for a single site, it can be used for large um, city-wide scale learning. So there's a huge amount of um, opportunities to use this and we think it can be applied across all sorts of different circumstances whether it's making investment decisions, whether it's a, a program of participatory budgeting, where you're given the community money to spend, we think the place standard tool can help shape all of these things. So in terms of the outcomes, what, what it does, I think it gives the local community a voice and an influence in these investment decisions. It identifies the priorities that the local community have. And that can guide either, either a plan or spending or whatever strategy you might be developing can be influenced by this and can be shaped by the local priorities that have been identified through this process. But so I suppose the key thing I want to emphasize and come back to that earlier point that it's not the only way to engage with communities. Perhaps the most important ingredient of the play standard is that idea of just having conversations. It's a tool that gets you talking to local communities to understand what their issues are, what their challenges are, what their priorities are. Um, and there are other ways of doing that, but the play standard, I think, is something that we found very useful in that regard. It's been applied, uh, although it grew from, from work that happened in Glasgow, it's now been applied uh, and adopted nationwide in Scotland, from Shetland, uh, the islands at the very far north of Scotland, um, to local communities beside Glasgow, have all used the play standard um, the next slide, this is something we're particularly proud of. We always like it when, um, when England adopts something that's been developed in Scotland. So we're starting to see the case study being used in England uh, in the development of their plan. So examples here from a place called Huddersfield. Um, but yeah, we, we quite like that to lead the way um, in the UK and for England to follow us. Uh, just last year, we had our first international place standard conference. So uh, off the back of that, we're starting to see the place standard being used in, um, in all of the countries you can see listed here and real interest in it internationally. At that conference, our, um, the Cabinet Secretary for Communities and Local Government was very positive in promoting place standard as a tool. Uh, and, and again, we've had very positive feedback from a lot of these countries who are now starting to see the benefits of it. We've also been working quite uh, over the past couple of years, we've been working with the UN, particularly linked to the sustainable development goals as to how the, the play standard tool might apply to those and vice versa, how the, the sustainable development goals might be applied to the play standard tool. And I think the next stage for the play standard, I think we're looking to, to develop more of a focus on sustainability and climate change in particular as part of that focus. But what, what has come out of all of this for me is that the idea of place as a determinant of health um, is, is now very much a part of the mainstream uh, in the UK um, from the Health Foundation and the National Health Service. The, the image on the right is of a book written by um, Nigel Crisp, who was a former chief executive of the National Health Service in England. Um, and that idea that, that health is made at home and hospital is for repairs is very much something that we would buy into. And I think the, the work that we've done um, supports that contention. What are we doing with the police standard now? Um, we are at a stage in Glasgow, we were, we were just at the start of the process of developing our new city development plan, uh, our second um, of, of this iteration of the document. So we're using the police standard tool online to engage with the whole of Glasgow uh, through a program called Place Builder. So this is an online platform, but we're using the place standard to, to shape that discussion. So this gives us a very early insight into what the, the priorities are for people across Glasgow. We're also using it more locally uh, in a part of Glasgow in the south central area to develop the local development framework there. And we're in the midst of that process at the moment. So we've just gone through an online place standard consultation. 
And this is us starting to get the results back to analyse those, and that'll help shape the framework for this part of the city. So just coming to the end of the things, quite often I'm asked uh, through this process, if I have a, uh, I was asked that question previously about my favourite place in Glasgow, and I'll take you back to the East End, and this is an adventure playground uh, in a street called Baltic Street. And you can just see the image at the top here of what that used to look like. Um, and this was identified as part of our kind of consultation program as a real issue that the children had nowhere to play. And what we didn't want to do was go down that sort of standard approach of let's put in, you know, some play equipment and let the children play. The idea who was uh, an idea developed by an award winning architects practice called Assemble Architects was that you basically create a safe space and you let the children build the space. So this was quite alarming for some people that you had um, young, young guys and young girls with hammers and saws and lighting fires and jumping off walls. Um, but it's actually become one of the best play areas in the city and one of the most popular play areas in the city. And they're actually doing some research now. You can see an image here of the, that idea of the adventure playground as uh, a parable for anarchy. Um, and as a planner, that's a kind of difficult concept that, you know, we want to plan places, we want to make places and, and build them. But that idea of just giving free reign to the kids to build their own space uh, was something pretty amazing. So you can see the image here, it says free to enter and free to play. Um, but within that, the children are given free reign to do what they like, um, take risks, build things, play with things that, that as parents we might think are dangerous or as planners, we want to have much more manicured. But it's a it's a brilliant place. I would urge you to have a look online and 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 have a look at it. But that's my perhaps my favourite place in the East End of Glasgow. So thank you very much. I only wish um, we we were doing this at a conference in Glasgow um, rather than online. But if you're ever over in the city, please um, feel free to look us up, and we'll we'll give you the grand tour. Um, and cheers from Glasgow. I'm happy now to to take any questions. I know that was a long presentation and there was a lot to take in uh, in my accent it's probably quite difficult for you and um, but if there's anything you want to ask me now I'm, I'm happy to to try and answer questions thank, thank you very much thank you very much michael for the amazing presentations um i would i won't take up too much time maybe just personal quick reflection on the presentation i think for me it's really really interesting um, to see kind of evolution of Glasgow from from the heyday of industrial city to the post-war uh, rapid construction and to the recognition of kind of uh, Michael used the word helicopter planning is not so affected and shift to more human um, or say user center approach and you also mentioned about the um, European city culture was also the turning point, really shifting that this focus. And then it's also very impressed. Um, the city of Glasgow has identified the public issue as one of the pressure points uh, to bring the city to a more equitable path much, much earlier uh, before all the uh, COVID uh, situation has appeared. And now uh, I would like to again um, open the floor or screen uh, to the other participants. So I have met a few kind of great guiding question to help us uh, to start uh, questions. So if you have any uh, question to Michael or comment on his presentation, just feel free to jump in um, to the conversations. I can, you can just unmute yourself, then you can just... Okay. Hi, I have a question. Um, first of all, thanks, you, thanks, Michael, for the great presentation. Very interesting. And um, the accent was fine. I mean, I love Scotland, so I always I very much enjoyed hearing you talk. So thank you. Um, I have two questions. One is um, when you did the script book exercise or um, did you have difficulties um, with like a language barrier? I mean, I, how, how was the population in the East End? Is it like Scottish people most of all are doing that with a lot of immigrants because in Gelsenkirchen we have a lot of you know especially in the um, you know these uh, affected uh, areas and a lot of people are immigrants and then it's uh, the participation is sometimes difficult because of the language barrier that's one question and um, the other question is um, 
I'm from the Climate Action Office, so I'm not don't do much work of in urban um, de redevelopment, but I would like to pass on the information to my colleagues. It might be interesting, you know, about the, the tool. Do you, are there German cities already using it? I thought it's on the list of the, the conference. So could you maybe tell me who's, who, or, and later on give me some information who that is so that my colleagues, if they have, um, you know, they might talk, would like to talk to German cities who are already using it. So that was two questions from me, thank you. Um, on the on the first question, um, the, the area that we did the scrapbooks in, although there, it was an area where much of the population moved out, so it wasn't necessarily a place where we had a lot of inward migration. So we had a fairly low levels of um, certainly compared to some other areas of the city. So we didn't have major issues with the, the language barrier, if you like. But what we what we did have um, was issues with people who had particular issues around literacy, and that's something that I think adults in particular can get quite embarrassed about. Um, so, as one of the community development officers, officers that was working with us was a was a local resident, but also was working on adult literacy schemes. So that what we did with that was we very much took a step back because. The, the people who were participating were much less embarrassed, if you like, to talk to somebody they knew from the local community who was involved in that programme, mm -hmm. rather than talking to the guy from the council with a, with a shirt and tie on, um, who they didn't know mm -hmm. and were perhaps concerned about, um, you know, admitting that they perhaps couldn't read and write so well. So, so they would sit with them and they would help them write their scrapbook. Mm -hmm. So that, that person would take their pictures but they would have somebody with them, a local resident or a neighbour mm -hmm. or a friend, okay. who would help them put down what they wanted to say. So we, when we've we have sort of used similar methodologies in other parts of the city, where there has been a much more diverse um, population in terms of ethnicity, uh, and, it, and it's quite it works quite well because you, you almost get the local people to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. So if somebody needs help with the language, then there's somebody else in the room that can say yeah. help them with what they're trying to say. So I think it's a um, that particular process was very cheap and very easy and the community did it themselves. We, we, we didn't have to do a lot. So things like literacy, language barriers and things like that didn't, weren't really an issue for us. Mm. Uh, in terms of the, the second question, mm. I, I don't know specifically what cities uh, are using it, but I can find out oh, um, uh, and we can let you know. I know that um, it's certainly been, I'm aware that it's been used in Holland uh, so far and I think Denmark. Um, but I'm not aware yet if it's specifically being used in a German city. Okay. Um, but my my colleague, one of my colleagues who I worked with in the East End, has spent the last sort of five years working on Play Standard almost exclusively, um, and she's very much embedded in the the National Play Standard Alliance in the development of the tool. So she'll she'll be able to tell me oh, uh, exactly great. which cities are using it, and we can pass that on. Yeah, yeah and I can do that. That'd be lovely. I can do Thank that you. through Ying Ying Chi. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that'd be lovely. Yes, that sounds really good. Um, definitely will facilitate this exchange. Make a note already on that point. So um, is there any other participants want to use this precious opportunity to ask question to Michael or have comments on his presentations? Can I, can I ask a question? Of course. Of the city of Dortmund. Also, thank you very much for the very nice presentation. It was really good. And I have a, a, a question in terms of your population. As I learned in the 1950s, you had about um, 1.1 million people on population in the city and it uh, decreased to 606,000 at the moment. So my question to you as a urban planner, uh, for you, was is it more a, a challenge because of less revenues and things like this when the population decrease in, in such a scale? Or do you see it more as a chance because of getting more space for different uses in a city? Because we also have this problem in Dortmund, but not on such a large scale. Um. It, it's it's not an easy question to answer because I think the 
in some respects, I think the idea of people having more space um, is, is very welcome. The, the big issue that Glasgow faced, if you like, was um, probably overpopulation in the inner city. Um, where you had people packed into very tight knit, very highly dense, um, very dense communities. But from a planning point of view, what, the, what those very dense communities did was create the networks that you need to support schools and facilities and shops. Um, and what we did through the, the kind of comprehensive development program that we spoke about was we effectively cleared out the inner city. So we left this almost a ring uh, around the city centre of, you know, dereliction and, and vacancy, and we moved people out to the periphery of the city, where I think, um, and my own, um, my own mum was part of this process. Um, initially, I think they thought it was great because they were almost moving to the to the countryside, and they had they had open space and fresh air, um, but very quickly it became evident that they were. The, these new communities had been built with no facilities or any, very little by way of facilities that you need to function as a community. Um, and actually a lot of their kind of social networks were lost and we're very much moving back to, particularly with, with a view uh, to sustainability, to that idea of a kind of compact um, city forum whereby we have higher density. But at the moment we're developing strategies to try and encourage people back in to live in the city centre, for example. You know, I, I'm not sure how the, the situation is in, in Germany, um, but certainly across the UK, we've got real challenges in terms of the traditional city centre and the retail environment. Uh, and, and obviously that's been exacerbated this year. Um, some people are shopping much more online and not visiting the city centre. So we are developing strategies at the moment to try and encourage people back to live in the inner city uh, and to repopulate. So I think it's just, I suppose for me, it's about getting the balance. I think we have a, a, an ambitious target to get up to, back up to about 700,000 as a population, probably over the next, let's say 30 to 40 years. Uh, we want to double the population in our city centre. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I, personally, I would, I would certainly like to see a higher density of people living in the city centre. There's less reliance on the private car um, and transport, we want to, our, our all of ambition, and I think a lot of cities are, are buying into this now, this idea of the 20 minute or 15 minute neighbourhoods. In Scotland, we've gone for 20 minutes. I know that in Paris, it's 15 minutes. Maybe we're a bit um, slower uh, in Scotland, it takes us 20 minutes. But that idea of kind of getting everything you need in your, your local neighbourhood, um, that needs density to support that. So I think it's just about getting the balance right in terms of design and how you present that. But, but clearly the half in the population of the city had a major impact in terms of how the city functioned. Thank you. Um, I, I would also like to quickly direct this question from Michael, perhaps to our colleagues, uh, Oliver from Cincinnati or from of our, um, about this, uh, sorry, uh, so for, for Oliver or for Jonathan from New York, New York, and uh, so our colleagues in US City about this question of uh, a stage of uh, decreasing population, or when we say shrinking city. Um, how do you, um, uh, from your experience or in your city, address this question or see this as, as opportunity, if you have something to share? Um, I actually lost connection and I just logged in. Can you, uh, can you say that again? Oh, yeah, I'd just like to direct the question of uh, Michel R. from Dortmund. Uh, the question um, was to uh, Michael, because in the history of development in Glasgow, there was a stage uh, the city has lost uh, lots of population, not lost, but a very sharp decrease in population. And the question is, uh, would, would, would the city, uh, from, um, uh, Michael's experience, was an opportunity? Or is a huge challenge, and how how does the city address such an issue uh, in terms of the population is uh, sharp uh, sharply uh, decreasing? Our, the... our, po our our population is uh, is interesting because it hasn't necessarily decreased. Um, uh, it's it's more become stagnant compared to the growth of the region, I should say. Um, 
so one of the, the things that um, like we've been blessed with compared to other urban cities is that we have a, a large, you know, long history of people living here, moving here and um, uh, a very strong immigrant population balancing things. Um, the, the interesting thing though, is seeing all the development around the city. Uh, that can also be referenced to why is not, I, I mean, I should, I should really rephrase that. Um, I mean, it's just a very interesting time to like see what's happening uh, with development in our area. Um, it definitely was the case though, uh, at least for the previous 30 years that things were a little rockier. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes, please. Perhaps there was more a question to Oliver um, um, in Cincinnati more than New York. But uh, hey, Jonathan, do you have any question to Michael? No, I, I, I really love the illustrations of, of the city. Um, I, I think that, that brought a, a really great emphasis on, on the, the concept of people interacting and playing. I, I think I will definitely use that in my own work. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Yeah, if I may. Of course. Uh, so a uh, couple things. So really enjoyed the presentation, Michael. Uh, planning a trip to Scotland in September if the pandemic allows. And so it's nice to have some local context to set the stage. Uh, Cincinnati has a similar trend line and trajectory. You know, we, our population was about 550,000 in the 50s, uh, shrunk to about 290,000. And now we are growing again for the first time in several decades. And it places uh, a number of stressors on our infrastructure. You know, we don't have the tax base to maintain uh, the sewer system, the roads, the parks uh, that we once had. But it also presents opportunity. Uh, you know, now that we are growing, we have opportunity for infill. Uh, we have, we, we don't have to race to install the infrastructure to accommodate that growth. But really my question is related to your analysis and presentation. So you, you did all of this community input and then it looks like you translated it into these, we call them radio charts or radar charts. Um, I'm not sure if that's scientific terminology or what you call them, but these sort of spider web diagrams that show strengths and weaknesses in different categories. We've done a number of different evaluations that have produced results like that. And I have found them not to be helpful communication tools. Our electeds scratch their heads when they look at them. When I attempt to explain them to the people, residents of our city, uh, I feel like it always results in confusion. So I, I wondered what your experience was. Is that a, an effective communication tool back to the people? Yeah, I mean, um, just, just reflecting on your uh, your first point, we've over the past few years, we've done quite a lot of work with um, Pittsburgh, which sounds as if it has quite a similar story to uh, Cincinnati. Uh, and yep. I was lucky, luckily enough to um, to be hosted by uh, Pittsburgh a few years ago. So the likes of Grant, um, Grant Irwin and people. So I don't think he's on today, but we've we've certainly shared a lot of, um, we have a lot of shared experiences, if you like, of cities. Uh, as cities, um, and they, I think, have gone through what sounds like a very similar uh, journey to Cincinnati. Um, and that idea that, you know, I, it, in many ways, I think it is an opportunity because in Glasgow, where we have an issue is that I think a lot of the private house builders want to build on fresh, new greenfield land, and we are trying to encourage them to build on um, what you would call infill or brown, we call it brownfield sites. Um, so there is there's challenges around that and a lot of our infrastructure is you know getting on for, for 200 years old now in terms of the sewers and drainage and stuff like that so uh, it's both an opportunity and a challenge but one that we, I think we welcome on on this specific point I think we would we would certainly I would certainly not encourage people to present the spider diagrams as this was the output of the 
this was the output of the play standard conversation. I think what we've increasingly we're getting better at is getting up how you extract that information and present it. Um, because like probably most people on the on the call, we, we all have to report to politicians and we have to report back to the community. So it has to be done in a way I think that you can understand. So we've got people now who are very good at extracting the information for the place standard and analysing it. Um, and you, effectively what you're presenting back is these are the priorities that the community have identified. So you don't necessarily need to present the complicated you know the, the inner workings of the play standard tool. It's about the outcomes. So what you what you what I would recommend is that you present is is really the outcomes of that process. So if the local community have told you that um, the local park's no good, you know just just use a nice infographic and something that says the parks are no good. Um, you know, and, and and if people really want to dig down into the evidence of that, you have it in the background. But I think it's just about kind of understanding your audience, I suppose, when you present that information back and say, look, this is the outcome of the, the process. This was why in some ways that very simple processes like the scrapbooks were worked quite well because it was everybody could understand it. Here's some pictures of the place and it, you know, it doesn't look great and we need to we need to invest here. But as we've kind of refined that and um you know government in particular are always keen to find a, a kind of standardized approach if you like. And it might be that play standard is replaced in a few years with something else, uh, which is why I suppose I was keen to emphasize that the key, the key part of it is having those, it's just a tool really to facilitate conversation. Um, and what comes out of that conversation is more important than, than the diagrams and the, the kind of complicated spider's web that you create from it. Um, but we found that once, you, once you've explained the process, people generally get how to do it. Um, it's just making sure that you, the, you then can support um, the community to, to turn that into something. So it's not, you're not asking them to analyse the results and, and do it. You've got to have that kind of support and expertise in place, but it's very much them just telling you, this is what we think is happening in our place or our neighbourhood. Um, and, and you take it from there and just present it in a kind of appropriate way. But yeah, we face the same challenges. I think um, trying to speak to to politicians and speak to people that are not necessarily engaged with the kind of technicalities of spatial planning or placemaking or whatever we call it um, can be can be difficult. You did a good job of also telling the stories alongside of it, which is the strategy I have relied upon more than the charts and figures themselves. Yeah, I mean, so I think those you. I think those human stories are, are you know much more important if you like than than diagrams and, and plans, ultimately. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, so the next guiding question would be, I think it's also perhaps also good opportunity. So Michael, to see other cities, uh, how other city approach neighborhood buildings. Um, so we see a play standard tool as a communication device and potentially as a way to monitoring the pro progress. Perhaps other cities uh, would also have interesting either tools or initiatives which can maybe briefly share with us. Because I know in German city, um, the idea of kids, so it's a translation of neighborhood, is also play a central role in city developments. So we'd be really appreciate it. Perhaps other uh, members uh, can quickly share maybe uh, your interesting cases or maybe the work currently you're working and engaged with, if there's any. Yeah, for example, I can uh, shortly tell how we do it in the city of Dortmund at the moment. Um, we have uh, some urban districts uh, with special renewal needs, we, we say to it, and they are uh, funded uh, by, um, by the EU uh, uh, government um, with a lot of money. And so we can put into this um, uh, special renewal urban districts, um, urban district managers. And, um, and they try to, to 
with this money and with special projects and uh, with the approach to the citizens of these um, uh, districts, we try to enhance uh, or we try to develop these districts to to a better status. You know that uh, that the uh, difference uh, between uh, the south district of Dortmund, where where people are living with higher income, and uh, the districts of the north are coming more close together. And uh, we have good experiences with this because this um, urban district management uh, is staying sometimes for five, six, seven years in, in these districts. And um, with a lot of projects, and um, uh, uh, we have a whole de department which is um, uh, uh, which is just uh, planning for these uh, uh, districts um, with special re renewal needs, and uh, and so with the time uh, we, we we could or with some districts um, enhance these districts, and um, we also could um, um, uh, establish uh, certain problems like uh, climate change issues, climate adaptation issues. Uh, now uh, uh, also into our environmental. Uh, 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 things um, into these districts and um, and yeah, that's our strategy at the moment. And um, and uh, a special thing is that uh, the city of Dortmund um, is also a city of structural change. And um, and we went to this um, direction not to use um, new uh, new natural urban space. We try to to take our conversion sites, the old industrial sites, to develop uh, on this. They are often contaminated, of course, but we try to develop these sites um, for new housing areas and um, and uh, industrial areas and the, and as working places. So we we created. Um, um, <clears throat> We created uh, the names working in the garden or living in the garden uh, in the last uh, decade. So um, uh, we have also special programs uh, for the, the districts. Uh, that's like uh, we do it at the moment in, in, in the city of Dortmund uh, with the neighborhood <laughs> development. Thank you very much, Michaela. Uh, yeah, as, as we know, we learned already from ECLA, Dortmund has many, many interesting urban rural projects in different scale and different nature. Um, I'm happy to perhaps also facilitate this knowledge change um, to Michael uh, in Glasgow. Uh, if you are interested, we're happy to also pass on some material for your reference. No, I, th I think that would be very useful. We're always happy to learn from um, from colleagues. I think one of the, the things that, that Michael said there that is obviously going to be an issue for, for us going forward is the, the mention of um, EU funding. Um, I thought I would get through today without mentioning um, uh, Brexit, but it's a big issue for um, parts of Glasgow in particular. We benefited um, quite significantly from investment from the through the EU um, so we're obviously going to have to think about how we how we plug that plug that gap we're still involved in a number of EU programs which I think will thankfully will carry on for a few years because once you're once you're committed to the program you can you can see out to the end but it's a real challenge for us um, particularly in terms of urban regeneration is that the, the European Union was always a good source of, of funding uh, but also of networks um, for learning about um, urban practice and sustainability and climate change, uh, all of which we'll we'll have to find new ways to to engage with uh, once um, after the end of this month, unfortunately. Definitely, yeah, we would be happy to facilitate this piece of information for you. And then, okay, so now we will go, we will have the last chance maybe for some open question or remark for today's topic, neighborhood building, or there are some particular area in the previous discussion. You will really like to perhaps have a few more minutes to elaborate on them. This is the chance. Just feel free to jump in if you have anything you would like to share or say. Yeah, this is Sebastian. Uh, can you hear me? Ah, Sebastian, yes. We can hear you uh, and see you very well. 
Yeah, my name is uh, yours, and I had so many technical problems here, so I'm sorry for I missed some parts of everything. Um, I switched to my smartphone afterwards because we have some um, Zoom issues with our uh, network security, and uh, this still di discussing since many months. So, um, so I, I want to come back to Michael and his Glasgow case um, with just one question. Um, I thank you so much for the parts I got. They've been very interesting, and. Um, I hope this is recorded, Ying, so maybe I can get just uh, review it yes, later. Yes. It's recorded. And, um, yeah, you had this health topic and this um, spider graphics. And then, so my question is, because we are working on that, if, if you can interlink this um, health topic with financing, like funding from health funds or, uh, um, if you do green infrastructure for climate adaptation, you upgrade a neighborhood and you have a health benefit also for neighborhoods. There is a financial interlink. Did, did you use this in your uh, in Glasgow? That will be very interesting for, uh, for me. We, we've, we certainly have um, a long, I suppose a long history now of engaging with the, with the health service um, in terms of their um, I suppose wider wider role, and I think reflecting back in the presentation, I'd reference, for example, the the book um, about health being made at home and hospitals are for repairs, and I think that's very much an idea that we've we bought into in Glasgow that there's more to health than the kind of traditional getting ill and going to the hospital or going to the doctor. Um, well, what I suppose we're not yeah, yeah I think is is convincing the the health board. You know, the, I don't know how much you know about the National Health Service, but it's always challenged in terms of its available funding. And I think it's a, a, a kind of slow process to persuade them that investing in things that are not traditionally things that they would invest in, um, you know, whether it's green space, where despite, you know, there is a lot of evidence to show that access to green space and an open space can have a significant impact, positive impact on your health. Um, They've not been, they haven't set aside, if you like, ring fest funding, particularly for that process. What we have in Glasgow is an approach to partnerships, so our health and care partnership um, between the NHS and the City Council is now reasonably well established. And there is a lot of investment through that in what I suppose what we call community planning, um, which is kind of bottom up planning led from the community. So indirectly that can lead to investment in um, sort of local green spaces and local facilities that are not necessarily directly linked to health. So they are involved at a kind of more strategic partnership level, if you like, rather than being sort of direct funders, if you like, of you know green space or open space and regeneration. But certainly the, the relationship for us with the Centre for Population Health, who I suppose are more of a kind of research um, background, if you like, in terms of um, what's what's been called various things over the years, but most recently the Glasgow effect. Why is Glasgow lagging behind even other similar cities in the UK in terms of its health indicators? You know that have gone like Manchester and Liverpool that have gone through a kind of similar shock, if you like, in terms of deindustrialisation. Glasgow seems to be, uh, or certainly was, worse in terms of our health indicators. So that was part of the background for the Centre for Population Health been set up in Glasgow um, to do much more in-depth research into why that was happening um, and perhaps new helping to identify new solutions to address that. And part of that might be in the longer term, the, the, the NHS taking a very different approach to, to how they provide healthcare and how they invest in healthcare, moving away from sort of traditional facilities, which will always be the, the sort of main part of their remit, is to run hospitals and um, doctor surgeries and um, the, the various other healthcare programmes. But I think, um, I suppose this year has hammered at home the importance of people's local environments and their neighbourhoods, um, and particularly access to good outdoor space, because that's the only thing that we've really been allowed to do this year, is get outdoors and, and walk. 
Um, I think perhaps in, in some ways this year might help in that regard with conversations going forward, notwithstanding the, the kind of immediate challenges that the health boards face in terms of you know vaccines and dealing with people suffering from from COVID. But I think in the longer term, I'm hoping or I'm positive that it might sort of drive a bit of a change in terms of how we how we invest in healthcare and how we see healthcare. I don't know if that quite answers your question. They've not been a direct funder, if you like, but we would certainly like them to be, or, or would certainly look to, to different ways of funding some of our ambitions. Yeah, we, we have a quite similar history, like Essen is in the rural area as Dortmund, and there is also this uh, transformation from industrial to green. And we have also, uh, not maybe as huge as you, but we have this Different in social and demographics in from north to south in uh, also in the history of how the city um, evolved and so that's quite interesting to see how you handle this um, as and as Dortmund we have some tools for this um, uh, social city development but um, I think it's more, so in our case, we need to have a more, much stronger link between this climate change, social health, uh, mobility issues as we had before, even in the financing. And I found last week a great um, example from London and they have a health fund who invested in local neighborhood mobility, uh, like a quarter of a million pounds. So they, they had this, direct investment from a health fund to the local neighborhood. Um, and I found another um, report which said that in Europe, in European cities, um, the health cost of each citizen is in the average is more than 1,200 euros a year uh, caused by uh, air quality. So that's quite a, a huge amount of money, which is like a um, on uh, community financed somehow, people pay for that. And um, that's a lot of money we, we spend for, for our health and it's caused by air pollution. So if we invest more in clean air on better neighborhoods, we can have a, maybe a huge amount of financing available for something which is more sustainable than um going to the doctor yeah that's a, that's a, it's my, our idea and um we have also some um maybe same as you that's traditional sectors which are not too good interlinked and the financial sectors same as the um uh organizational sectors in administration or responsibility? Is it a local level? Is it organization? Is it like uh, responsibility is on a state level? Or uh, so that is also very sectorized in a, and then has to be much more interlinking. In that. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it sounds as if you're, um, I would certainly support the the ambitions that you have, I think it's it's a good idea. And you know, we obviously the model in in the UK is that healthcare is free at the point of contact. Um, but I think the you know the healthcare the health service has to be paid for somehow. And I think it's always all it's almost on the. It seems as if certainly from the outside looking in that they're always talking about underfunding and crisis. So actually exploring new models to to promote better population health um, can only have a positive impact. I think it's almost that first step along the road of saying, right, that, that previous model perhaps isn't um, appropriate anymore or doesn't work as well as we'd like to. And perhaps a lot more of the investment should go into, um, you know, whether it's, you know, the kind of climate change stuff that you talked about and air pollution, which is a huge issue for us. Um, you know, we, we've started to identify these kind of low emission zones within the city centre because of the levels of um, air pollution that were, were present in some parts of Glasgow. So it's certainly something that we are thinking about as a city and we've got really ambitious plans in terms of 
um, becoming sort of carbon neutral by I think 2030. Um, you know, which is it's quite an ambitious target, but certainly the, the the city administration is very committed to that process. And at a, and as I said, at a strategic level, the partnerships and the the networks are all there. I think it's just about that traditional investment model in the health service hasn't quite changed yet. Certainly from my, there might be elements of it happening, but certainly from, from my position, I'm not, I'm not aware of a huge change in that regard just yet, but I think hopefully it's coming. Thank you, Sebastian. Yeah, Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I, I would um, pass on the information Sebastian has just mentioned to you, Michael. I mean, after the meeting today, uh, as well as the um, new funding uh, from Michael. And as well, I will pass on perhaps uh, from your colleague, Michael, and about this uh, play standard tool uh, to the city of Kirchner, Kirchner, to Susanna. And she yeah. has this great interest to really um, perhaps to adopt this method and perhaps uh, would the opportunity arise when we use it. They will use it. Okay, I think, um, thank you everyone for today. Very, very vibrant discussions. Um, maybe I would just, because uh, I think we are now um, closing to the end of the sessions. I guess more or less all of us has expressed ourselves uh, regarding to the topic. Uh, in the end of the session, I would just like to uh, quickly is, uh, maybe introduce you our plan for next year, if it's okay for you. Or you still have some open question? Okay. Um, so now we have five minutes. Um, I will just take maybe one to two minutes to talk about next year. Just give you an overview. So as you know, um, the change cycle is a, uh, a co-pillar of uh, urban transition alliance. And for the next year, um, we have already seven cities expressed interest to participate in the trend cycle. So we have city of Baltimore, Cincinnati, Essen, Kirchen, Kirche, Katowice, Glasgow, and Yuha district from city of Shijiazhuang um, have expressed interest to participate for the next trend cycle. And at the moment, we are at the stage of mapping different interests, and hopefully uh, we will find a lot of overlapping area in terms of change topic. So this is kind of the, um, the focus we will work on for the next uh, few months. Yeah, Dortmund is also interested. Oh, very good. Then I will also uh, <laughs> add the Dortmund on the list. Um, but I think Dortmund's topic more or less will continue uh, on the topic of a climate relevant assessment, I, I would presume. Okay, yeah. 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 Yeah, so I think, but the, for the other seven cities, I think we're still kind of uh, uh, elaborating um, and identifying the tranche topic. And that would be, I think, the, um, um, also the topic for the next webinar, which would be the beginning of next year. Okay, in the end, I would like to thank again so much uh, for Michael for his presentation and participation, and thank you all of you. Uh, for the wonderful discussions. And I wish you already an early Merry Christmas uh, from the UTS Secretariat team here in Bonn. And have a very, very nice day. Thanks. Bye. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank, Bye. You. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Nice to meet you all. Have a nice Thanks Bye -bye. so much, everybody.